farming in your own backyard. Coming up next. Looking, looking good though. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to the show, Garden to Table. What we're about today is backyard farming. It's really kind of interesting how much you can grow in a small space. We're gonna take a look at some bees here with my friend Larry who keeps hives in his backyard. Also in the show, we're gonna head to South Arkansas where another friend of mine has two French Alpine goats and you won't believe the amazing cheese she makes from their milk. And later, a simple way to grow potatoes in very limited space plus this amazing cheesecake that you're gonna to wanna to stick around for. Now we'll get back to the bees in just a few minutes, but first I wanna focus on, a, well, one of my favorite backyard animals, the chicken. Come on, let's go. Time to go to bed, come on. Hey, if you ever wanna surprise a friend, bring them a live chicken, and that's exactly what I'm doing with my friend Marion Barry. Marion. Alan, look, I can't believe you brought me that chicken. I look told you her. I was going to. I didn't think you would. I can't believe it. It's so good to so see good you. So good to see you. So look should we go her. around or go through the house with her? Go through the house. Okay. We've had chickens in the house before. All right. No I'm, she's anxious to meet her new friends. Oh, good. I hope they like her. <laughs> look good. at that. She is really pretty. So Marion, how many chickens are you up to now? I only have six right now. Lost oh, okay. one recently to... Um, a dog because she was out roaming the neighborhood. Uh-oh, well, yeah. this happens, it doesn't does. it? It does, Well, this is a silver-laced wine dot, and uh, we've got beautiful. a big flock of them. And uh, well, she she is beautiful. She's, she's showing a little wear here at the back where the cockerels have been busy this time of year. Well, she'll be safe from that here. I don't have any roosters, <laughs> and my hens don't like them very much anyway. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I don't blame them. You know, it's interesting. I think a lot of people think you have to have a rooster to have eggs. You'd be surprised how many people have asked me that. Yeah. I have to tell them no. You know, yeah. we don't have to have roosters. We have eggs. Yeah, about <laughs> how many eggs a, a day are you getting with, from your... I get about three or four a day. Yeah, that's great. That's good. That's plenty more than we need. And you'll be getting one more now with her. I'm excited that she's already laying. She's still fitting great. I'd love to see, everybody has their own sort of form of chicken coop and protection. I'd love to see yours. Come on, let's go look at it. <laughs> oh, look at this. Poultry yeah, bill. Yeah, <laughs> this is it. This is their little coop. She is going to love it. She is I just going to love it. Too, well, here, I'm going to hand her off okay, to you. Okay, let me get this girl. I know, nice I know. You're going to like it here. I think you are bonding. I do too. I can tell. Well, this is great because, um, so what, what roughly is the square footage of the house and the run that you have attached to it? Probably about 60 square feet. 60 square feet, yep, yeah. that's, that's about right. That's 10 square feet per girl. It is, yeah. right, which yeah. is way more than is required. And so you can um, obviously let them out and they enjoy the, the, the garden, but you can also lock them in. I see you've used this uh, one inch poultry wire and so far that's kept everything out. As long as I keep the door closed and locked, they're safe. I haven't had any problems. You know, I have to say some of the features I like here, the run itself has a roof, which is very good protects them from the elements. Yeah, but they can still be outside right. um, in the run. And then the house itself on the back, you've got that raised nest box thing going. So I can get to the eggs easily. Yeah, yeah. that's good. I have uh -huh. that, that as well on one of our pins. But I tell you, I, I just love your setup here. It's just wonderful. It's nice to see it's, a bit of farming in the city. Thanks, yeah, it is. It's great. It's really simple too. Well, I can tell she's gonna have a wonderful new home. Aren't you, girl? <laughs> We're going to be making a Greek chicken kebab stavros today. It's a very easy, heart healthy, simple marinated chicken kebab that's grilled and served over a chopped Greek salad. You begin with a boneless chicken breast marinated in some extra virgin olive oil with lots of chopped fresh garlic cloves, fresh oregano, 
and I like to use dried mint leaves. It has a little bit more of an intense flavor than the fresh mint that we'll use later on when we assemble the kebab. And a little bit of kosher salt and black pepper. Got the marinade ingredients together. Something very important, especially if you're not using a metal skewer, soak the bamboo skewer in cold water for about 30 minutes so they don't burn. And you're going to simply alternate the boneless chicken breast. I like to use uh, red onion for some color. And then whole leaves of fresh mint. And just repeat that. So you've got two or three nice big pieces of chicken on the skewer. And this is a generous portion for a luncheon entree or a light dinner. I think that two of these over the chopped Greek salad would be plenty. If you don't want to make the salad, this is equally delicious just on its own. Very low-cal, very fresh. I've got that on a grill, fairly high heat. I'll assemble another one, and then we'll pop it in the oven to finish it off. Primarily putting it on the grill to get the nice grill marks. Again, this is something you can put together so quickly, and it's so fresh and absolutely delicious. If you're in a hurry for time and you want to do this marinade early in the day and assemble the skewers right before you're going to eat, that's easy to do. So while the chicken is grilling, we can put the salad together. I like to use the sweet grape tomatoes because they are flavorful year round. I've got some cucumber in here some pitted Kalamata olives, a little bit of red onion, more fresh oregano, garlic, lemon juice, and in the end, I'm gonna crumble up some feta cheese. Give that a good toss. When you're getting the salad together, give it a taste. If, it, if the, the ingredients need a little punch, if you wanna bring up some flavor, add a little bit of lemon juice. Uh, I've also got a little bit of red bell pepper in here. Yellow bell pepper would be pretty. No lettuce, just a pretty classic chopped Greek salad. Checking the chicken kebabs, they're getting a nice grill mark on them. Once that happens, can, you can continue to cooking, cook them on the grill, or I tend to finish them off in the oven. I think that makes the chicken more moist and flavorful. So I'm gonna take this, pop it in about a 400 degree oven for about five minutes until the juices run clear. And then to plate it, you could serve this family style on a big platter or individually. Got the salad in the middle and when the chicken comes out, we'll crisscross the skewers there. Perfect light lunch or dinner. I have to say I'm crazy about potatoes and there's so many different varieties with different subtle flavors. I love them mashed, baked, fried. Who doesn't love french fries? Growing potatoes is easier than you think. You see here this year we planted nine different varieties of potatoes. I think we planted almost 600 pounds of seed potatoes and the yield, well, we're not sure yet because we're just now beginning to dig them. But you know, you don't have to have a lot of space to, to grow potatoes, and just about any variety of potato can be grown in a bushel basket like this. It's a great project for kids, and if you just have some old potatoes that you're not going to cook and they're showing some of those eyes, you can drop them in here and you can grow them in a basket. So what I'm gonna do is just show you, these were planted about 14 weeks ago. And this variety, is very productive and look at all the potatoes that are coming off of that. When these were planted it was just a small piece of potato so I've got three, four, five, six, looks like six potatoes that I grew in this basket with just some loose soil with lots of humus in it that drains well and that was 
planted in a bushel basket that had the bottom of it cut out, as you can see here. That's just enough soil to produce a potato from a small piece that had the eye on it. Now this variety is called Superior White, but you can grow any variety in a bushel basket like this. You want to plant them early. Um, it, as early as February in the southern parts of the United States, and you'll harvest them in early summer. And the way you know that it's time to harvest is the vines begin to look like this. Just a few months ago, these were beautiful vines uh, with lots of green foliage and white blooms on them. But now that they've begun to die back, it's telling me it's time to get the potatoes out of the ground. Now, I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine, Susan Harper. She lives in a beautiful home in El Dorado, Arkansas. And from looking at the front of her house, you would never expect to see what she keeps in the back. Two French alpine goats, affectionately named Martha Stewart and Julia Child. These two girls produce over a gallon of milk each day. And Susan takes that milk and makes some of the best goat cheese you'll ever eat. I don't know anyone else who has any goats in their backyard to tell you the truth. I'm a pretty good milker at this stage because I've been doing it for a couple of years, so I'm pretty fast. It takes me probably 15 minutes to milk her out totally. See, this left one's about done, but the right one always has more in it. So. I never really knew that I would love it this much. I live in a small town and I'm a cheese freak. Uh, we have no artisanal cheese store here, unfortunately. And so I just decided one day that uh, I'd like to make my own and I had to either get my own goats or forget the cheese making. Goat cheese making is a very easy process. Okay, we're pasteurizing the milk. Take a big pot, a big stainless steel pot. Pour your milk in. My recipe calls for three and a half gallons of milk. Then the main idea with pasteurizing is to bring your milk slowly up to 145 degrees. Um, you want to keep it at 145 degrees for 30 minutes. Now we're putting the hot milk into a cold water bath, which I probably will have to add ice to later on to get the temperature on down to 72. Sometimes it takes about two hours to bring it down to temperature. Okay, now we're going to add the pasteurized and cooled down milk to my cheese box. And it's nothing but just a Tupperware box. This will have to sit in this box for 24 hours, 18 to 24 hours generally, um, until it coagulates to the right consistency. Here's the bacteria that we're getting ready to add. It's in a powdered form and you use a half of a teaspoon to three and a half gallons of milk. Sprinkle it in, stir it in with a slotted spoon real slowly till it's very evenly distributed. Then the next thing you add in is the rennet, and it comes in a liquid form. You dilute it with some water and stir it in next. Make sure you've got it all well distributed, and then you uh, cover your box and let it sit. So, to load the molds, all you do is take a slotted spoon, reach down into your curds, and lay them gently into the mold. But if you lay them in gently, over the next 12 hours, the curds will knit together, as they say, and make one cohesive unit. After the cheese has sat in the mold overnight, or for the equivalent of 12 hours, the next step is to flip the cheese in the mold. And the reason you do this is to make sure that your cheese is, is sinking down in a uniform shape. So the only, what you do is you turn it upside down like that, tap it a couple times, then gently Put it back into the mold and slide it down. Put it back on the tray. After 12 hours of sitting again in the cups, the cheese has released all, almost all the way it's going to release. And it's time now to turn the cheeses out so that they can finish draining and drying on these mats. They've all been flipped. So you take them out one at a time and lay them on the draining mat. And you can see finally it's beginning to look like chev. This is the salting process. So we're going to take each one of these chevs and salt it pretty liberally on all sides. And by that I mean the top and all around the edges as well as the bottom. 
pretty heavy. Well, here's the finished product. Three rounds of Chev, each sprinkled with a different kind of topping. That's one thing that, about Chev that is so great. You can make it however you want it to taste by adding different things to the outside. This one has uh, just black pepper on it. This one is a mixture of cumin seeds and mint, which I know sounds really weird, but it's so delicious. This one has a mixture of French herbs. And I like to also serve my Chev with hot pepper jelly. That seems to always be a big hit with everyone. I think sometimes crusts can be a little bit intimidating for people when it comes to baking, but I want to show you one using toasted hazelnuts. I have two cups of toasted hazelnuts here. I have a fourth a cup of sugar, and I have a half a teaspoon of cinnamon. That's really all it takes for this stage. Now, this is a great recipe for cheesecake crust. That's all you have to do, pop it out into a bowl, and then add one stick of butter. That's salted butter. And work it up like this. And then what I do is just then Put it in a spring form pan and press it around the bottom. Just pack it evenly and firmly all the way around the bottom and presto, it's as easy as that. In just a few minutes, I want to show you how to take this hazelnut crust and put it to work with a delicious cheesecake. It's a citrus honey cheesecake. Now, I wanna talk about honey for just a moment. If you wanna be a backyard farmer, one way you can do it is to keep bees. I've been living next to Larry for eight years now. When Larry moved in, I did not know he would be bringing bees. I do feel like that I've benefited from Larry's bees being so close uh, with my flowers and my vegetable garden, but and an occasional sweet jar of honey doesn't hurt the situation either. And How long have you been keeping bees, Larry? I started uh, helping my granddad when I was about 12 or 13, and uh, I kept bees while I was in high school for 4-H yeah. projects. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that worked out really I was really in neat. 4-H, I did chickens. <laughs> you did the chickens. Yeah. Uh, well, I did demonstrations on bees and beekeeping yeah. and uh, made it a lifelong career after that. And well, it's amazing how you can keep, keep bees just in your backyard. You don't have to have a lot of room. Neighbors don't mind them. They uh, don't bark and they don't bite unless you're right in their way. Yeah. Well, let's take a look here and let me get a hive tool. So they're building the, there's some honey there. Yeah, they've, they've got quite a bit of honey brought in. This was completely empty two weeks ago. So on a hive of this size, um, or I should say a single, a single hive, how much honey in a really good year would you, how many pounds of honey would you produce? On a single hive like this? Yeah, and you know, I know you're gonna save some for them to go through the winter with, so subtract that out of it. How much could a person harvest, Larry? and enjoy through the winter and the next year from a single hive. Easily uh, 60 to 80 pounds of honey. Isn't that and amazing? still leave abundant supply for them to live on through the winter. Just fascinating. And there's the queen. There's Where? The queen. Oh, here she is right here. Look right there. With the she white has a little mark. white dot on her. See her? Well, I don't want to touch her. Larry, I sure have enjoyed it and I appreciate you showing me your little backyard farm here. Thank you. Yeah. Keep up the good work. I've enjoyed it too. You're in a real sweet business. It has been a sweet business for sure. <laughs> now I want to show you how to make one of my favorite desserts, cheesecake. Who doesn't love cheesecake? 
This one is really special because it blends lots of flavors that I really like. For instance, honey and citrus into the cheesecake. And we're gonna put all of that on this hazelnut crust. So that's why it's called a honey citrus cheesecake. Now what we're gonna start out with, we're gonna start out with cream cheese. And what I have here is a pound and a half, and that's um, three one pound um, sticks of cream cheese, Philadelphia cream cheese. And it goes in the blender here. And then I'm taking a half a cup of sour cream. It goes in. And I'm gonna get that started. And while it's going, I'm going to add some honey. I kept the cream cheese at room temperature, so it'll be soft and it'll blend nicely with the sour cream. And now what I'm gonna do is take this honey and fold it in. And there's three quarters cups of honey what you want to do is you want this to run long enough to where it's all smooth. You don't want any clumps. Honey is so beautiful. It has that gorgeous golden color. And that's going to take a few minutes for all that to blend together. looks really smooth, so I think I'm going to stop and just let you see how smooth and creamy this is. Okay, so I'm going to lower this because it's time to add the eggs, and I'm going to add six um, egg yolks, of course, from our chickens here. And then I'm taking some vanilla. I've got one tablespoon of vanilla, and then I have some orange zest. I have one tablespoon of orange zest, and I've been working on a tablespoon orange or lemon zest I should say right here and I'm adding that and it's time to mix all that together. So there we go. All right that looks pretty good. <clears throat> okay now we want to take the egg whites and I'm going to take these over here and we're going to make a meringue and this will really give the cheesecake um, some lightness. So I have those uh, whites from the six eggs. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just take this mixer and whip these eggs till they make a meringue and we get little peaks. And at that point, I'll start introducing some sugar. Okay, you can kind of see that we've got some peaks occurring there, which is pretty good ready to start adding the sugar and I've got about a fourth of a cup here so I'm gonna gradually in I'm gonna do is gradually add the sugar just amazing what happens when you whip egg whites is really all you're doing is you're just introducing air little tiny air bubbles it causes the egg white to stand up. Of course, now we're sweetening it. Okay. Now what I want to do here is I want to introduce just a little bit of this at a time into this. I'm just doing it gradually, a little bit at a time. Now we're ready to take it out and pour it into the pan and pop it in the oven. Okay, now all we have to do is pour the batter into this nine inch spring form pan. Ooh, look at that. Good stuff. So I'll pop this in a preheated oven, 350 degrees for about 50 minutes. It'll stay jiggly in the center at the end of 50 minutes. Just turn the oven off and keep the oven door ajar and let it rest in the oven for about three hours. Let it cool off and you're ready to serve. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. The next time you drive through a neighborhood like this, think about what might be in the backyard just on the other side of the house. You never know. And I hope in today's show, you've been inspired to do a little backyard farming yourself. Until next time, Good eating and good health.